Thank you all very much for coming. I always have to check when I see a, a crowd this large. You're all aware that this is a talk about DNS, right? Yeah. All right. Okay, so um, I've got to be quick since this entire slide is like 35 minutes long. Um, but I'm going to give you like a two slide history of Core DNS. Um, the project was started by a guy named Meek Gieben, who you may know because he actually wrote two uh, earlier. DNS servers that were used in containerized environments, SkyDNS and SkyDNS2. And uh, what happened was that he saw Caddy and kind of admired Caddy's architecture and the fact that it was plug-in based. And uh, he had written what, what is really the most popular uh, Go language DNS library. And sort of like in the old 1980s Reese's Peanut Butter Cup commercials, he thought, well, OK. I've got a Go library for DNS functions, and I've got a server architecture in Caddy, and if I put the two together, then I can come up with something like uh, a DNS server written entirely in Go that uses plugins. I don't know if you remember this commercial. It's the two 20-year-olds who walk into each other around a corner, and uh, one of them gets peanut butter, and the other one's chocolate, and the other one gets chocolate, and the other one's peanut butter, and apparently this is how Reese's Peanut Butter Cups came to be. It made me wonder, looking back on it, why anyone would walk around with a jar of peanut butter? <laughs> uh, apparently, that's something we did in the 80s. Um, but uh, CordiNS actually has had a, a pretty rapid evolution. Um, we, we brought it to the CNCF back in 2017, and by uh, December of last year, so only you know 11 months ago, it became the default DNS server that shipped with Kubernetes. And then just a month later, in January of this year, uh, it reached graduated status within the CNCF. So we're, we're very pleased with its, uh, with its success. Now, some of you may be thinking to yourselves, well, why do I need a new DNS server? Why, uh, why core DNS versus the old cube DNS or any of the alternatives out there? Um, one reason is that core DNS is written entirely in Go, so it is memory safe. Uh, there, um, it, it has built in very straightforward Kubernetes integration. So very easy to use with uh, Kubernetes. And somewhere out here uh, is Sandeep, who had a lot to do with actually writing that Kubernetes integration, and, and as did John. Um, and it has this plugin architecture, and there's this very rich ecosystem of plugins that do all kinds of interesting things, some of them not entirely uh, obvious to you. And, and that's really what this session is about. And more of them are being written all the time. I think we just checked one in, the policy. Uh, the policy uh, plugin, a big enhancement to it. yeah, which yeah. is a, a major enhancement allows you to call out to OPA, for example, to make policy decisions uh, within your DNS server based on uh, things that OPA may tell you. And it's easy for some value of easy uh, to write your own plugins, uh, which is to say that I couldn't do it, but John could do it. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about DNSSEC support in uh, Core DNS. A lot of this stuff uh, was added because I think Meek is really a, a proponent of DNSSEC. Um, for those of you uh, who have been paying attention to DNS uh, for the last 20 years or so, we've been working on DNSSEC, right? The DNS security extensions. These are cryptographic extensions to DNS that allow you basically to digitally sign zone data, and they also allow suitably configured recursive DNS servers to cryptographically validate that signed data. And that's important because that cryptographic validation shows you two things. One, that it really came from the zone you thought it did. For example, that the IPv4 address for www.google.com is the one that Google signed initially. And also, it proves that it hasn't been modified since it was signed. And that's important because you might be getting it out of the cache of a DNS server, an intermediate DNS server, that you don't necessarily have any trust relationship with. And this should be important to those of you who are advertising DNS data uh, to access services that you might have uh, running within your Kubernetes cluster because you don't want that stuff modified, right? You want people to be able to trust the fact that they're really getting to the endpoints that you think they should be getting to. Um, we call signing the process of actually adding the uh, digital signatures to a DNS zone um, there are particular resource records called RR SIG records, and uh, there are different ways to do signing. We'll talk about a couple of them that Cordina supports. At this point, most of the top-level zones out on the internet have been signed. So the root zone has been signed, com, net. Uh, most of the country code top-level domains have been signed. So you have a continuous chain of trust, as we call it, from the top of the internet's namespace to you know, almost any place uh, in the hierarchy. And 
Most operators of big cloud-based recursive DNS services like Google Public DNS, uh, Cloudflare, which runs 1.1.1.1, um, Quad9, these guys all support cryptographic validation using DNSSEC. So these are all good, good reasons to deploy DNSSEC. Unfortunately, DNSSEC for a long time was a pain in the ass to implement. Uh, Core DNS really tries to make it very easy to do DNSSEC. There are two different types of DNSSEC that are supported. One of them is signing on the fly, which you can use with just about anything, anything that will, for example, dynamically generate or synthesize resource records uh, within Core DNS can also uh, then sign those records. And then there's the more traditional method of signing uh, DNS data supported by DNSSEC, or uh, by Core DNS, which is actually adding those RR SIG records, those cryptographic signatures uh, to zone data. So, and we'll talk about both of those. So this is the way that you would sign on the fly with uh, the DNSSEC plugin. Uh, the first thing you do is you create either a common signing key, which is a, a single uh, asymmetric key pair that you're gonna use with uh, a zone for signing, or you can use uh, a split key arrangement called a key signing key and a zone signing key. That's done for, for practical reasons, basically. Um, the reason you do that is because if you use the same key over and over and over again to generate these signatures, then you, send, you tend to sort of use up the key. Those of you uh, who know crypt cryptography better than I do understand this, and then you have to rotate the key periodically. If you do that and you only have a single key, then you also need to communicate the fact that you rolled, a, rolled the key over to your parent, and that's a real pain. If you split those uh, functions into a key signing key and a zone signing key, then you can keep signing, and then only uh, when you, when you uh, roll over the zone signing key, then you just re-sign with your key signing key. It's only when the key signing key changes that you have to communicate that to your parent. So uh, here's a, a command that you'd use uh, with a program called dnssec-keygen. This generates uh, a key pair for you. In particular, here we're using uh, ECDSA, which is an elliptic curve uh, asymmetric algorithm. This is what all the cool kids use now because it produces nice small uh, signatures, or relatively small signatures. Um, so you should probably do that too. And this will generate two files. It'll print uh, in the output what's called the base name. The two files are the base name plus dot key, which contains the public key, uh, and the base name dot private, which is the private key, which of course you should keep private. And then you add the DNSSEC plugin to your server block. So here's an example of uh, a zone called foo.example, and foo.example already has its own data file called db.foo.example. We add the new DNSSEC plugin below that, and we just refer to the base name. So we just say key, file, and then whatever the base name is. So the name of the dot key file or the dot private file without the suffix. And that's really it, right? Now, when you send queries to your core DNS instance and you indicate the plus DNS sec flag, you can see that you get a whole bunch of additional data. You can see, for example, in the answer section, when we looked up the SOA record for foo.example, we also get an RR sig record for foo.example, which is the digital signature that covers that SOA record, that allows someone to validate that SOA record. Similarly, in the authority section, we have the two NS records for the zone. We also have a corresponding RR sig record, which will allow you to cryptograph cryptographically validate those NS records. Cool, right? Super easy. And it's important to note, again, this works even if you're not dealing with a file, even if you're dealing with something like the Kubernetes plugin where you're actually synthesizing data that you're pulling out of Kubernetes via an API, you can still cryptographically sign that data. Uh, the sign plugin is a more traditional way of doing DNSSEC, right? This is manually adding those RR SIG records to a zone data file, but it does it, I said manually, but it does it all by itself. Uh, the one limitation here is that you have to use a common signing key. It doesn't support the zone signing key, key signing key split. So uh, again, here's how you do that. You generate your common signing key. I didn't do this, but it's easy enough to do just like you did before with DNSSEC-keygen. You add the sign plugin to the server block that handles queries for uh, a particular zone. Here you see uh, var.example, and we're loading it from a file that we're gonna call db.var.example.signed. And then uh, we have the sign plugin below that. It says sign the file db.var.example. That's what's gonna generate the file db.var.example.signed after the signing happens. And we also refer to the, key, to the uh, particular key that we're gonna use to generate those signatures. So. Pretty straightforward, 
and again. After we reload our, our core DNS instance, we get nice signatures within our zone data file. Now, this might be the preferable way to do it if, for example, uh, you were then transferring this zone to other non-core DNS name servers. Uh, and then the other thing I wanted to talk about just briefly is DNS over TLS. How many of you have heard of DNS over TLS or DOT? Great, okay. So uh, DOT's been supported by uh, core DNS for some time. It can handle queries that are received over TLS. It's very easy to do. All you have to do is within your server block, rather than just having a domain name, you use something that looks like a URI, TLS, colon, slash, slash, and then whatever the scope is. So if it's every query that you want to handle over TLS, it would look like TLS, colon, slash, slash, dot. And then in this top example, we're just going to forward all queries over to Google Public DNS at 8.8.8.8 and at 8.8.4.4, and we're going to cache responses. If you just wanted to limit the scope and say, hey, I just want to handle TLS queries uh, within foo.example, it'd look like the example down at the bottom. And there's also some tuning and tweaking that you can do, of course, um, in order to handle those queries that are uh, received over DNS, over TLS. You have to have some sort of a certificate. This is just uh, what you guys will recognize as an open SSL command to generate uh, a, a TLS cert that you can then install. And then below that, there's uh, a TLS uh, the TLS uh, plugin there where it actually names both the cert and the key file. And in fact, if you want to, oh, sorry, this is, this is just verifying that you are in fact talking over TLS. So I used OpenSSL uh, to actually connect to the running Core DNS instance and make sure that it was talking over TLS. Is it HTTPS? This is not HTTPS. This is actually DNS directly over TLS, so DOT for short. DNS over HTTPS we call DOE for short, and that's DNS over HTTP over TLS, which is, from a protocol standpoint, kind of an abomination, but um, <laughs> we're not going to go there today. All right. Um, you can also do some configuration on the client side. So, for example, if you wanted Core DNS to use TLS to communicate with something else, uh, you can do that. So, for example, here we're forwarding uh, all of our queries up to Google Public DNS, which supports DNS over TLS, and we're going to forward those over DOT rather than just over DNS over port 53. So we just add that TLS colon slash slash 8.8.8.8, right? And, in fact, you can specify client auth authentication if you want to, uh, the CA uh, that you're going to assert, uh, the TLS server name and stuff like that, using the format that you see down at the bottom. With services like, for example, Google Public DNS, it's not generally necessary to do that. Google doesn't care about your client auth stuff, right? They're not going to demand that. And then the last thing that I wanted to talk about was just managing zone data with Git. This is something that we cover in, uh, in learning DNS as well. Um, most of you guys probably use Git on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And maybe you think it would be fun to manage your zone data with Git as well because it gives you the ability to have distributed management of zone data. You can roll back. You've got version control. You've got all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and so this is an example of using Git and a special plugin called the Auto Plugin uh, in order to do that. So the Auto Plugin basically allows core DNS to scan an entire directory to say, I'm going to scan this entire directory and I'm going to look for files that match a certain pattern. If they match that pattern, I'm going to assume that they are zone data files and I'm also going to extract the domain name of the zone from the file, right, the name of the file. So here's how we do that. Uh, this auto, direct, or, uh, auto plugin says, look at the directory Etsy core DNS and look for any files that start with db dot something or other and that dot something or other, everything after that first dot, that's the domain name of the zone. And reload every one minute. So scan this directory every one minute. Anything that I put in here, boom, load it, assume that that's a zone data file and you ought to be authoritative for that zone. So the other half of this is that we obviously have to have some sort of a program in order to pull information out of Git and then plunk it in that directory. So uh, here's an example of a little program called Git Sync, which you can get uh, from the Kubernetes distribution, and you can use it to periodically synchronize this zone data uh, using, for example, a command like, like this. 
And so that, I think, is the end of what I have, and I think I get to turn this over to you. Right? Sure, absolutely. All right. So, John Bell and Eric. All right, thank you. All right. All right, now we'll talk about, or I'll talk about a couple of little um, fancy tricks you can do, um, things that you may not expect to be able to do um, with your DNS server. Um, so Core DNS, because of this plugin type of, of uh, architecture, uh, each of those plugins has an opportunity to make a decision about what to do with the request or the response coming back. Um, and so built in, there are several plugins that will do things, things like that. Some of them are very simple. We have one called this load balance plugin, uh, where if you query for, say, uh, A records with a given name and you get back three or four records, it'll just shuffle the order. And that way, uh, you can use it kind of as a DNS-based load balancer. A lot of clients will just take the first one. And this way, even if, if the client is not too bright and just takes the first one, um, then uh, it'll, it'll still work. Um, but then there's other fancier things. Um, I list a few here, and I'm going to show you what the configurations would look like there for those. Um, the, uh, the first one is template. So template lets you, you synthesize data. So like uh, Cricket was saying, you know, sometimes we read data from a file, but we also can pull data uh, or just generate data uh, or pull data from another source. So the Kubernetes plugin pulls data from the Kubernetes API, the um, file from a file. There's actually ones for pulling things from, from, uh, from etcd or from uh, Postgres. Um, but the template one actually will just manufacture them out of whole cloth. So this, this little core file here describes how to create a template that, um, that, that will essentially create generic, uh, generic entries for a certain pattern of domain name. So in this case, IP dash, a, dot, a dashed quad, um, dot example dot com will return that, that dot, that as a dotted quad for A record requests, it will return nothing for any other record request, because according to spec, uh, you shouldn't return an NX domain if there's some value for some record at that name, even if it's not the one people are asking for. And then if you ask for anything that doesn't match that pattern, it will, it will, uh, it will respond with NX domain, no such, no such domain. So a couple of interesting things to note here. Um, so the, 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 the template, the way it works is you can list it multiple times, and the as a request is processed, uh, each template stanza, each, te each instance of the stanza here, the, the template plugin will check if the query matches this, uh, in this case, uh, hideous uh, regular expression. And, um, and if it does, then it will answer, and the, the answer here is, is basically, uh, you can use Go templating, but it's essentially, a, a look, should look like just what you put in a zone file. So it's just a, a, an RFC compliant uh, statement of a record here. In this case, we're going to do the name. Uh, there's in the documentation, you'd find the specific values that you can use in this template. Um, name, and then we're going to capture from these groups, group A, B, C, and D, which is what these, this regular expression up here um, shows you. The, it creates these named, named groups in the regular expression capture. Um, the next thing you see here highlighted in red is fall, oops, is fall through. So typically within the, the way that a core DNS plugin works is the expectation is that the plugin would be authoritative for the zone in which it's, um, it, that it's handling. And so normally a, a, if a plugin uh, receives a, a query and processes it and say doesn't find a result, um, it will just return NX domain. But some of the plugins uh, we want to allow to take a look at the request, decide whether or not they know anything about it, but if they don't know anything about it, pass it on to the, to the next, uh, next plugin in the chain. So that's what fall through does. Essentially, if you get back, uh, or the, the, if the request, if this plugin's uh, analysis of the request determines that it's an NX domain, rather than returning NX domain, it falls through the next plugin and just passes it on. So in this case, um, when you get a match for something that's not an A record, uh, and it's, it's any other type of record, 
but it still matches the regular expression that we showed up here, then um, we're going to return the, the no error R code. Basically, it's, it's saying everything was good, all successful, but we're not actually returning any answer. We're just returning an R code, just data. So the template will allow you to specify an answer or an additional section. There's a number of different um, pieces of the response that you can templatize. Finally, that falls through too if, if the match does not match here. So this is how we handle this third case of food.example.com is uh, in that case we're saying, well, we, don't want to we just want to reply. There's no such domain because it doesn't match any of our, uh, our template patterns. Now, we can take that um, another step, and once we've written all those complicated templates, maybe we don't want to have to do the same thing for .org and, uh, as we did for .com. Um, in fact, there's, there's some uh, other ways to do this, but, but, well, you'll notice in here, right, .com is in here. So in order to still match the regular expression, but have the exact same behavior for our .org, we can use something called the rewrite plugin. Rewrite works sort of like an HTTP write, uh, HTTP rewrite in, in Apache or Caddy, where we can look at the input and then we can, we can tweak the result and then pass it on to the next plugin. So this is another way to manipulate things. In this particular case, I'm gonna manipulate the name. Um, I'm gonna take any request that comes in for .org and I'm gonna map that .org to .com and then I'm gonna pass it back down the chain. Whatever those plugins down the chain do with it, they'll send back a response. I'll take that response and this second part of it here says modify the answer to flip it back the other way. Now the reason we do this, if, if, um, if a DNS server returns a query and the answer in the, in the response doesn't match the answer that the client sent out initially, properly behaving clients or careful clients will reject that. It's, a, it's just an anti-spoofing, or it's a security measure to avoid uh, manipulation in the uh, transport. So we, of course, have to subvert that security measure and go ahead and uh, trick it in order to tell it that it's, that it's, uh, that it's .com. So this is actually also useful. Here I'm using it for a sort of very simple purpose, but this can also be useful um, in situations, for example, uh, in Kubernetes where you'd like to use the same uh, certificate for a service for external traffic and internal traffic. So say you've got a certificate for foo.example.com, and internally, when things are referring to that service, they're gonna to refer to it as foo.namespace.svc.cluster.local. Well, that's not gonna match the certificate, and things are gonna fail. You can actually program the DNS server such that internal clients can also use foo.example.com, and then CoreDNS would translate that into the service name, the, the, the Kubernetes style service name, pass it on to the Kubernetes plugin, which returns the correct IP address then, and map it back. So from the point of view of uh, the client's uh, TLS, it all looks good and the handshake succeeds. Another one I wanted to talk about are uh, several different, different plugins, and I'm gonna demo this one in a minute, um, is the metadata plugin and the firewall plugin. So built into CoreDNS, the standard default image that you get, um, there's, a, there's an ACL plugin. And that ACL plugin allows you to control, um, request, or to block requests that, uh, based on the IP address of the, the client. Um, but we also have, as an externally buildable plugin, uh, the firewall plugin. That allows you to do arbitrary expressions um, based on the data that's in the request, and also based on this thing we call metadata in the request. Um, and in fact, it even allows you, it, it does arbitrary expressions simply in the, in, in the core file directly, but in fact, you can also use it to call out to uh, either OPA, or which was the thing we mentioned earlier that's just recently merged, like yesterday, that you can call out to OPA, uh, but you can also call out to Infoblox's internal, or open source uh, policy engine that they use in some of their, their projects, um, which is where this was originally developed. But in any case, what I'll show you is an example um, where uh, we can actually 
allow, we essentially password protect our DNS server such that only clients that pass this proper eDNS option uh, can, can make use of the server. Um, a little background there, eDNS, extensions for DNS, uh, is a, a way to attach additional data, additional um, options with a data value typically to any given request and uh, that can be interpreted by the server however you want. So this is used often, um, like probably your home router actually uses this, it attaches uh, the, the, the client subnet and that helps the service provider decide uh, what response to give uh, you based on your, your, your uh, n how near some given server is to your client subnet or something like that. So it's a pretty widespread thing. It, your, your individual clients don't use it, but, um, typically, but it is something in the infrastructure. So in Core DNS plugins, metadata is uh, something that, that, that it's a way for any plugin to sort of publish information that can be used by other plugins. So for example, the Kubernetes, if you enable metadata, the Kubernetes plugin will publish, uh, it'll break down the request and publish like the, the namespace as an, as uh, as a namespace you know uh, under this tag namespace, or um, the you know the service name, and then you can use those later in your logs. So if you wanted to log uh, log things specifically um, in a specific say structured log, you could do that using the metadata one. And in fact, with Kubernetes, we have the ability to enable what we call pods verified mode, which which will listen on pods, and when it does that, it actually will map back in the metadata. It'll take the source IP and map that back to the original pod. So you could actually log in your DNS logs the, uh, both the source IP, the, the, the source pod name and source namespace uh, of the client, as well as of the server. So that could be useful. And, and with Firewall, actually operate on that. So we'll, I'll mention a few things you could do with that later. But in any case, our situation here, what it does is uh, metadata simply enables the metadata plugin since it, uh, w w when the request comes in, the metadata plugin picks it up and it'll actually call all the other plugins before they even see the request and sort of give them a sneak peek of it so they can parse it and do whatever they want and look up data somewhere if they need to and then it'll pass it down the chain. Um, the metadata EDNS0 is used to parse metadata, take, take those EDNS options that were attached to the request, parse them out, and publish them within this metadata for other plugins to use. So in this case, what it's gonna do, it's gonna create um, a metadata tag named secret, and, uh, and it's gonna do that by parsing option 65,200 out as bytes and just sticking that in as the data value. The firewall plugin is smart enough to take advantage of that and allow you to create this expression. So here, this refers to that metadata, the metadata EDNS0 secret, and it's saying only allow this to proceed if the option attached contains this value. So this is essentially our password and, uh, for, for this DNS server. Um, otherwise, we're gonna, we're gonna refuse all other queries. That's what refuse true means. So um, let's give it a try. And uh, all right. So what I have here, I have my, um, I have this core file, which is just what we just saw. And I will run, Cordy and S here. And then we can try, I'm gonna run a, a client as well, just, all right. And let's try to query, remember we have those templates in there. Let's try and query this. All right, so we see the query come in and it gets refused. That's because in our query, we do not have any eDNS option. This is just a plain vanilla DNS request to this IP address. If we look at, where did my, ah, there we go. If we look at this dig command, it says attach EDNS opt 
6200, and this is the hex for, uh, for that password. I guess I'm gonna have to change my banking password now. Um, and we see now it comes in, we get the no error, and in fact, we get back one, two, three, four because our template matches that format and returns the one, two, three, four. Um, let's try another one just so we can see how our template will, will give us an NX domain for something that doesn't match. And we see in the query log um, that yes, it came through, but oh, yep, we got the NX domain. And of course, we see the same thing in the client. So that's some of the fun tricks you can do with the template and the rewrite and the firewall. And if you extend that with Kubernetes, um, you can actually build, and maybe I'll do this for Amsterdam, you can actually build a multi-tenant um, service discovery using these things. These are sort of the primitives you need to do that within a Kubernetes environment. All right. So how much time do we have? Four minutes. Four minutes only? Okay, crap. I'm out of time almost. I also do have multi-service multi-cluster service discovery. I won't demo it, um, but actually that, um, that link up there is some scripts that will do it in, in a GKE environment. But basically there's a plugin called Kubernetes. It allows CordeNS to talk to multiple cluster API servers at once and then publish that data. Um, it has some limitations, like cluster IPs are meaningless, right, across clusters. So it's really for headless services. In a GKE environment, pod IPs are routable, so it's useful and meaningful. Um, but given we only have four minutes, I won't demo that now. You can check it out on the, the GitHub there. And uh, we'll leave the last couple minutes for questions. And I have to say, for those of you who ask good questions, we have some uh, signed books to give away. <laughs> so start thinking harder. Can we light that mic over there? The, um, the firewall functionality that you showed, I wasn't sure if it was a plugin or not. Um, is that dynamic or does that have to be in the core file before you start CoreDNS? Ah, so all CoreDNS plugins have to be, um, it's an external plugin, so it doesn't come by default in your CoreDNS image you're just gonna pull off of Docker or GCR for that matter. Um, you would have to build your own custom one. Um, I have one built there if you want to play with it. It's on my public GCR. Um, but um, it's easy, and, and you can go back and watch the video of the deep dive yesterday. I show you how to rebuild with a, with a plugin. Um, but the core file, there's a reload plugin that allows your core file to reload at any time. So that would be one way to do it without having to do it right at startup. But the other thing is, since you can actually call out to OPA, or you can call out to this Themis policy engine, um, the policies live there then, and all of the you can just populate those policies on the fly, um, which is actually what Infoblox does in their in their one of their product offerings is they have these big Themis engines full of policies, and then CordeNS calls out to it with each request. Question here. You can get a book. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Right here. Ah. Yep. Yeah. So, so a general question about the product itself. Like, do you guys have any plans to do weight-based load balancing? Uh, at the at the DNS server level, and the reason why I ask is like you know can we actually start looking at core DNS to do something like a GSLB, right? You know and then configure GSLBs using core DNS because we, you know there are a number of vendor products that we actually use right now, and we would love to kind of like see core DNS actually support something like that. Well, I don't know that we have any plans to do that, but I mean it's certain oh, you could do that within a plugin actually if you yes. <laughs> Absolutely. You, were feeling you, ambitious. Could, you could do that in a plugin, or I have to say, right, policies are arbitrary. So um, it's theoretically possible you could actually do that within one of these policies, but they would have to hold the data too and do health checks and do a lot of things. So uh, it's, not definitely, it's not in our plans per se, but it is certainly possible. Okay, everyone, that's all we have time for question wise. I'd ask for a massive round of applause because. Yeah. Thank you. I know there are a few more questions. If you find uh, Cricket and John uh, towards the back and ask those questions, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you for joining us.